Please open your Bibles to John chapter six, please. John chapter six. John chapter six, beginning in verse one, if you would like to read along. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed Him because they saw the signs which He was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain and there He sat down with His disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus, lifting up His eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to Him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This He was saying to test Him, for He Himself knew what He was intending to do. Philip answered Him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, He distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, He said to His disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those uh, who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which He had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take Him by force to make Him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. <clears throat> so in this narrative, we have uh, two groups and one individual uh, who witness a great miracle, and uh, each of these have an opportunity to learn an important spiritual lesson from what they've just seen. So the first group is the crowd itself, the people who were there. And what they learned was nothing, they learned nothing. Uh, they wanted to make Jesus king uh, because He filled their belly. Uh, you know, the mother of all welfare programs. Imagine having a leader who could miraculously meet all their needs without any effort from them. So they saw the miracle, they didn't learn anything. Then there was another group of individuals, the apostles were there. They also learned nothing. Uh, a little while after seeing this miracle, we learned that they were in a boat with Jesus and during a storm they became afraid and lost all confidence in Him, fearing for their lives. Losing all confidence, being afraid, being with Jesus, the one who had just miraculously fed 5,000 people. So they obviously learned nothing from the miracle. And then the third individual was the boy. He was there too, remember? The boy. Now he learned something important. He saw a tremendous need feeding these thousands of people, he realized that what he had was not sufficient to meet that need, so with a childlike trust, he put the little that he had into the Lord's hands and he let Jesus fill the need. So his small act of faith was multiplied into a great miracle. So what did he learn? Well, he learned what the crowd and the apostles missed. He learned that just a little bit of faith is multiplied when placed in Jesus. If you have just a little bit of faith, it can produce great things when that little bit of faith is placed into Jesus Christ. So there's a lesson for us here. We, like the crowd in the story, we have all kinds of needs. You know, they were hungry because they had been with Jesus for several days. Well, in the same way, all humans, ourselves included, you know, we have physical needs, we have emotional needs, spiritual needs that require attention. Every single day we have needs. Now, there are different ways to respond to need, and this story illustrates that how we respond to our needs determines the quality of our lives and our ultimate success. So the types of responses. So there's the crowd response, the crowd response to need. Well, the crowd mentality is to follow anyone or anything who has a quick and easy answer. That's the crowd response. For example, lose weight, but eat all that you want, never exercise, 
just take this little pill. I remember seeing a sign once, several years ago, I think you may have seen it too, it was a sign on a post. You know, like you see these little cheap signs, you know, I buy old houses, or, well there was this little sign, hand drawn, and it says, um, uh, lose 40 pounds uh, simply by applying cream on your thighs. <laughs> I don't know if somebody needed to lose weight on their thighs, but anyways, this was the sign, it was amazing. All you had to do was buy the cream, rub it on, boop, you lost weight. That's the crowd response. You know, give in, go with the crowd, go with what's convenient, whatever is easy, the easy way. So the crowd response you know, leads to a person to rationalize their poor behavior many times. So long as there is no pain, no restriction of self-will, no restriction of pleasure, we're willing to go with the crowd, we're willing to go with, you know, with what's easy. So the crowd response is well described by Jesus in Matthew 7, 13, when He said, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and many, meaning the crowd, are those who enter by it. The crowd goes by the broad way, the easy way. That's, that's the crowd way. And so one response to the pressures and needs of life is to go along with the crowd and do what everybody else is doing and go the easy way. The easiest route to achieve you know, the things that we need. That's the crowd response. Then there's a second type of response to need and that's the analytical response to need. And this was the response actually given by the apostles. You know, the analytical response is the response of human wisdom. Now in this case, Philip carefully figured out how much it would cost to provide basic minimum food for everybody. He even gave it a dollar amount. Boy, we're going to need a couple of hundred denarii if we're going to feed this whole crowd, get everybody, you know, everybody gets a little bit, but he had it figured out. He had a plan. Now had Jesus allowed it, they might have tried to achieve this with what they had. Let's pass the hat, see if we got a little money here. Of course, this response is well represented in our modern high-tech world of human achievement and the new world, new world coming upon us, artificial intelligence, used to be just sci-fi stuff, but not anymore, is it? You know, today, man believes that he can figure out the answers to you know, political, ecological, social, and economic problems with science, with technology. Technology is going to fix it. What did the, was it Zuckerberg who said you know, uh, his, his, uh, <coughs> his plan for 2016 uh, was to create uh, some sort of machine that would take care of all of the needs of his household? Get a machine to do everything that has to do. Get a computer to take care of, of everything. Science and technology, you know, we've figured it out. And a lot of people buy into you know, the, doc, the, the doctrine of you know, progress through achievement and it's two main ideas. The two main ideas of progress through achievement is first, you can achieve anything if you try hard enough and long enough. And two, your value as a human being is based on how much you achieve. That's the doctrine of human achievement right there. Some Christians have been seduced by this doctrine and they've added a kind of a spin you know, in order to spiritualize it. What they say is, you simply ask God to bless you in helping you achieve your goals. You figure out your goals and then you ask God to help you achieve your goals. So the analytical response to need is to apply the wisdom of the world to the problem. And the conventional wisdom today says, basically, try harder, try longer, work harder, do more. We need more research. You ever notice that when they interview scientists? And they, they're trying to resolve a problem, but in the end they always say, well, we need more research. We just have to study it some more. You know, gun violence, what do we do? We need to study it some more. Every year, people killing each other, people killing each other you know, in the streets, so on and so forth, you know, violence. You know. And what's the answer, the an analytical answer? We need to study it some more. We need to make some new rules. And you know, I'm not getting into the whole gun debate here politically. I'm just looking at, at people in general, how our society today, our modern society, how we think we're going to solve problems. 
more study, let's try harder, let's experiment more, let's put more money on it. There's no doubt that we're going to solve the problem, but all we have to do is just learn more. Of course, this approach does not understand that mere human wisdom and human strength is never quite up to the task of solving human problems. You know, the Olympic Games, it celebrates human achievement at its highest level, but what does it actually solve? Well, nothing. In other words, we're always less than the sum of ourselves. Solomon said, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Why does he say that? Why does it seem right to a man? Well, it seems right to a man because he thought of it. <laughs> There's always a way that seems right to a man. His idea, how he's going to solve it. And Solomon says, you know, if, if, if your solution is your solution to a problem, not God's solution, the thing that you've just figured out, the end of it is what? Death. It's not going to work. So there's the two first, the crowd response and the analytical response. And there was a third response and that was the response of faith to need. Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? You need faith to get into the kingdom of heaven. And children naturally are disposed to believing, to having faith. Now the child gave the response of faith in that he put what he had into Jesus' hands and he let the Lord fulfill the needs by multiplying what the boy had originally given to him. You know, everyone here at this moment, in this place, has talents, abilities, resources, and when we use them with human wisdom or for our own needs or profit, they'll only provide a limited return. Not, not, not no return, no, of course not, but a limited return. When, however, we put the, these, these, these same abilities and resources into the hands of the Lord, we learn the lesson of faith multiplication. I'll say that again because I put the accent in the wrong place. We learned the lesson of faith multiplication. That's better. Faith multiplication. For example, here's the, here's the uh, equation, okay? What I have times the Lord equals I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 13. Now here's another equation. What I have times the Lord equals He can do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Ephesians 3.20. That's the response of faith. That's how to get things done through faith. When we put our talents and resources in His hands, Jesus multiplies them beyond our greatest expectations. The Bible is filled with examples of such people. For example, Abraham put his son into God's hands, literally, and his descendants became like the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea. David put his life into God's hands, and what happened? He became the greatest king of Israel. And Mary put her reputation and her future into God's hands, and what happened to her? she became forever blessed as the mother of the Messiah. And Peter put his future into God's hands and he went from fishing for fish to fishing for souls and found a much greater treasure. And Paul put his talents into God's hands and he became the greatest missionary, greatest epistle writer. And Jesus put his human life even Jesus put his human life into the Father's hands. And what happened? He provided eternal life for all those who followed after him. You see the multiplication of faith, how that works? Here at Choctaw, if we put this church into God's hands, who knows what he'll do in the future? You know, sometimes uh, you know, when you get together with folks, people talk, visit, and so on and so forth, and then you, you know, the, the conversation, especially for Christians, uh, tends to gravitate towards the church. How's the church doing? 
And if you um, are in a position of responsibility, perhaps you're a deacon, an elder, something, you're, you're a ministry leader, somehow. A lot of times when we talk about the church among ourselves, sometimes it's like, eh, you know, we worry. Ah, we're going to make the budget. You know, we worry. Boy, I wish we had more of this, or well, attendance is down, and oh boy, you know, we don't have the right teachers for this place, and how are we ever going to make it? And, you know, just we worry about stuff. And one of the things that, that comforts me is the thought, especially when I'm doing this thing, because I'm as guilty as anyone else, the thought that comes to me is that the church, you know, notice the name on the sign. It's called the Church of Christ. In other words, it's the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. It doesn't belong to Minister Mike or Minister uh, you know, uh, Harold or, you know, Minister Marty, eh, Deacon Joe. It doesn't belong to us. The church belongs to him. He makes it rise. He makes it, it belongs to him. He's responsible for it. I'm responsible for my task. I'm responsible for what the elders have assigned me to. Yes, I'm responsible for that but I'm not responsible for the church, otherwise it'd be called the Church of Mike. I don't think attendance would be that high if that was the name of the, the, name of the place. So the, the lesson is simple and it's sure. Our talents yield a much greater treasure, a much greater return when we put them into the Lord's hands. All right, so this is a fairly basic principle of Christianity. I think it's apropos. We've talked about the budget. We've had some exhortations about taking things you know, seriously and so on and so forth. Elders presented their vision, their view of some of the things that we're going to be doing next year. So I think this is fine, this lesson here. Let's remember to put our, you know, our talents, our expectations, our hopes and so on and so forth. Let's put that in the Lord's hands. Let, let Him work here. So I, I think that's okay to say that. But the question is, how do we know? How do, we, how do we know when our lives are really in His hands? That's the thing. Very nice to give an image, you know, put this into Jesus' hands, but how do we know we've actually done that? In other words, how do we know that we truly have given over our talents, our abilities to God? Because it's not always as simple or evident as handing over some bread and some fish. So there are signs that indicate that we are responding to need, not with the crowd mentality, nor with human wisdom, but with true childlike faith and trust. Here's some of the signs that this is what we're actually doing in our individual and in our corporate lives. First, our pride is broken. Our pride is broken. You see, the source of our ineffectiveness is not the lack of skill or training or opportunity or money many times, it's usually pride. What, what was the thing in the newspapers? A perfect example, uh, uh, the, the, the Mexican drug lord, El Chapo, escaped the high maximum prison in Mexico. It cost two million dollars to dig the tunnel. It was ingenious and it took months, but they pulled it off and he escaped. Imagine, he escaped. So they caught him again. And why did they catch him? They caught him because he was reaching out to actors and producers in order to make a film about his life. <laughs> Serious. Sean Penn, the American actor, actually met him to discuss what kind of a screenplay, what kind of movie this would be. Can you imagine that? And because of that, the Mexican Marines and intelligence officers managed to track where he was at and captured him. Pride, vanity. You know, many times we're too proud to change or to learn or to try or to repent. And, and that pride is usually the cause of a lot of our, our problems. God will glorify Himself through us only when our pride is broken, not when we become more skilled, more wealthy. What did somebody say? One of the jokes going around because of the Powerball, you know, the billion dollar prize, and 
I saw this joke where somebody was praying and saying, Lord, please let me prove to you that I could have a billion dollars and not change. <laughs> it's not wealth that we need, it's humility. <laughs> it's humility that we need. These are gifts that He gives to us, not the other way around. Having talent does not glorify God. It's using talent to serve Him. That's what glorifies God. When our pride is broken, the opportunities to grow and to serve, to be profitable for the Lord are greatly multiplied. We really become a useful uh, object in his, in his hands. You know, the little boy, he knew that he didn't have the answer, but he gave his lunch to Jesus with the hope that maybe he had the answer. You know, what gives glory to God is when you are able to say to him or to someone else, I'm sorry. When you're able to say to someone and willing, let me help you. When you have the courage to say to someone, will you study the Bible with me? It takes humility to be able to say those kind of things, but those are the kind of things that glorify God. It's only possible to say these if your pride is broken, but when you can say these things, the blessings in your life are multiplied greatly. So if we want to really be profitable for the Lord and fruitful for the Lord, let's not ask for more skills, let's ask for more, uh, more humility. A very difficult thing, you know, like we, we say, never pray for patience, you, know, you pray for patience and the roof caves in, right? It's also, it's dangerous to say, Lord, please humble me, help me to learn humility. Well, believe it or not, that's a very hard lesson, because humility, usually comes through pain in some way or another, but the value of it once it's learned is, is tremendous. Well, another sign of true childlike response of faith is when an individual is, be, be, is becoming at peace with God. They know it in themselves and they share it with others because peace does not come with meditation or medication or being by yourself, or having money in your savings account, or your house paid off, all good things, gives you a certain feeling. These things create some kind of security, but not peace with God. Peace with God comes only when we submit to God. And we submit to God when we finally abandon our desire for personal accomplishments, personal self-sufficiency, we have no peace because the desire for glory and self-justification is incessant. We work so hard to not have to depend on anybody. <laughs> I don't want to depend on anybody. And that's okay to be independent, to take care of your things, take care of your own business, not you know, be dependent on someone else for no reason. But many times we take that idea too far to the point where we don't even want to depend on God for anything. This desire is mastered only when we realize and accept that without Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. But with Him, even our smallest efforts can yield tremendous results. And when He says, you know, without me you can do nothing, it doesn't mean you can't walk across the street or you can't laugh or you can't you know, plant a tomato plant. He was saying, you, you can't do anything to please God. You can't do anything to transport yourself from this human dimension to the spiritual. You can't do that by yourself. You need me to do that. We have peace with God when we realize that everything we do in the name of Jesus, even giving that cup of cold water, everything we do in the name of the Lord has eternal consequences and eternal benefits. When we abandon the desire to accomplish by ourselves and for ourselves and begin using the principle of you know, multiplying by faith, one of the first benefits and signs is that we experience true peace with God. True peace with God. You know that peace that surpasses understanding, why does it surpass understanding? Because it's not a response of analysis. You know, like the apostles, well, if we have this much money, we can feed all of these. 
The peace that surpasses understanding is the peace that God gives us and we can't figure out how He's done it all, but we know we have. And then one other sign, just pick three, one other sign of that childlike response, the power of God becomes evident in us. You know, if they had collected money to buy food, imagine they pass the hat around, they, they collect money to buy food, how would God have been glorified? Now we know that God makes the food, makes the food to grow, He, he maintains the sun in the sky, we understand that idea. But at that particular moment, when that crowd of thousands of people were hungry and they had a need, an immediate need, how would God have been glorified if the apostles passed the hat and said, all right, we'll be back in three hours, we're going into the villages, and we're going to get bread, and blah, 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 and everybody eat, and everybody, maybe, let's give thanks. Thank you, Lord, thanks for the bread, it's great. Everything worked itself out, but would God have been actually glorified? Or if the boy had simply shared his lunch with a couple of the apostles, and even you know, given some to Jesus, how would God have been glorified by that? But in giving his resources to the Lord and expecting him to solve the problem, the stage was then set for God to be glorified. So when the principle of multiplied faith is working in our lives because we are putting our talents and resources, our very lives into the hands of the Lord, then the power of God becomes evident in us. God doesn't want to be kept secret. His glory is not to be kept under wraps. He wants to be glorified, but the channel of His light, the channel of His glory, you, you and I. I mean, how many of us who know um, uh, Brother Jim uh, McRae, you know, how many of us who've known him for years, big, strapping, strong guy, you know, and now has had to battle cancer for two years, two and a half years? How many of us have known PJ? Bright, cheerful woman, always a good word for everyone. She's had to minister to her husband, leave her job, minister to her husband, day and night, not for two weeks. I mean, I had a cold for a week and I thought it was terrible, but two and a half years. And, and, and what is it about, and I'm, not just them, we have many others in our congregation who have suffered silently for a long time, but I use them because I think a lot of people know them. What is it, that, what is it about their situation that makes us kind of respond to them? We're saying, we say to ourselves, how do they do it? The guys that I know, men, you know, who like to hunt or fish or be out or play sports or you know, take care of their business or fix their house, they're saying, oh Lord, please, I, I couldn't do that for two and a half years to be stuck in a chair in a bed, you know, having my wife have to take care of every, every single one of my needs, couldn't even get up and go turn the channel on the TV. What is it about that that's glorious in some strange way, that these two managed to be faithful and at peace and joyful and ready to ask you about how are you doing, how is your life, and thank you for visiting or calling, you're such a blessing to us. How do they do that? I'll tell you how they did that. They took that disease and that problem and literally put that thing into the hands of Jesus Christ. And I'm not just saying that in the service of my lesson. That's what they did. That's what they continually do from day to day to day. And what is the net effect of that? Well, God is glorified in their lives. We, we, we say to God, Lord, <laughs> thank you for sustaining them. Thank you for helping them. Thank you for giving me even an opportunity to serve them in some small way, bring a meal, just visit for an hour, whatever. God's power is evident in our lives when our pride is replaced with submission and obedience 
when our slavery to sin is overcome, when good is done in Jesus' name and only for God's honor and not our own, when trials are endured with patience, when lies are overturned with truth, when hatred and jealousy and selfishness are conquered with brotherly kindness, somebody comes at you with evil, somebody comes at you with an event, with an offense, and you return, you come back with kindness and forgiveness. God is glorified. When the world hears the gospel of Jesus Christ from our lips without fear, without embarrassment, God is glorified. Jesus is exalted. The power and the presence of the Holy Spirit is manifested through those kinds of things. This power, this glory is evident when, like the little boy that we confidently, uh, who confidently turns over to God whatever he has, when we do exactly the same thing as him, when we confidently turn over to God whatever we have in order for him to bless, to multiply, or to glorify as He desires. You know, people want the church to grow. I mean, of course. You know, we, we're going to put a billboard up, and we, maybe a, a sign that's a little brighter, a little, you know, little easier to read, so on and so forth. Why? We want them to know that we're here. But once they know that we're here, what will they see that will impress them? Well, hopefully what they'll see is these people have put their lives into the hands of, of God. Of course, we want great singing. Who doesn't want great singing? We want great singing. And of course, we want the preachers you know, to prepare and to give us lessons that challenge us and that are interesting and obviously biblical. And we want our teachers to teach good classes. We want our youth group to be doing things that, you know, we, we want all those things, why? Because those are the things, those are the things that honor God. But nothing honors God and glorifies Him more than when each of us individually, no matter where we are at the stage we are at in life, when we put our lives into His hands. We're not here to impress the community. We're here to put our lives into God's hands and they will be impressed by seeing God glorified through our actions. That's what we're here to do. And so the question that this story poses to us, obviously, how do we respond to life's needs and challenges? Do we go with the flow, the past of least resistance, whatever feels good, is that, is that, you know, is that our operating uh, uh, procedure? Do we try to do it on our own? You know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Go and do it my way. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. You know, is, that our, yeah, is, that, is that our operational mantra? Get out of my way, because I'm going to do it my way. Or do we realistically assess what we do have, no matter how small, and allow God to multiply it in order to meet all of the needs and all of the challenges in our lives? So if you've been going along with the crowd, or if you've been going it alone, I heartily encourage you to respond like the child and to put your entire life into God's hands and let Him multiply His blessings in your life through faith. And if you do that, He will be glorified, you will be edified, and the world around you will receive the true witness of the church of Christ. So if you need to respond this evening in any way, certainly to respond to the invitation to repent and be baptized, perhaps you may need the prayers of the church for whatever a reason. Perhaps you've been visiting with us and have not yet signaled your desire to be part of this congregation, put yourself under the leadership of our elders, whatever. We have this opportunity now as Ron leads us in a song of invitation. Let's stand and sing that song, shall we?